exalt his name together. Hallelujah, hallelujah, God. We glorify your name, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't God good, church? Isn't God good? Our pastor and his wife are in London right now. They're preaching and ministering down there. So I have the privilege of ministering this morning. And I really believe that the message that God has put on my heart is a timely message. It's a timely message for you today, for me today. I was humbled and broken just having a chance even to study it for myself. And I want to encourage you this morning to open up your heart. I believe this message is for you. Um, and I believe God's going to speak to you this morning. Can someone say amen? The subject is the dawn of redeeming grace. Let's say a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, if it wasn't for you, where would we be? Lord, if you hadn't stepped in, when you stepped in, where would we be? How much worse would it have got? But thank you. Thank you so much, God, that you came. You stepped in. You reached down. You found us. And you called us to yourself. You called us your own. And we're here today because of the grace that you've placed on our lives. Lord, this morning, this afternoon, as we go into your word together, we ask you to speak to us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come, to have your way, to move in the way that you want to move. We are open to you. We give you praise for this, Lord, in advance. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. The dawn of redeeming grace. Someone say that word grace. Say it slowly. Grace. So it's December, which means it's Christmas time coming, which means many, many people, most of us are going to be giving some gifts and receiving some gifts. Some of you have already finished your Christmas shopping. You're amazing. Some of us will start our Christmas shopping soon. Because <laughs> there's something good about that. I know it's commercial and all that, but actually, at its, at its heart and spirit, there's something beautiful about giving. There's something beautiful about giving a gift to someone. You know, you think about it, you spend what you can on it, and you give it with all your heart. There's something really special about that, isn't there? You know, that's even why we as a church, we're also going to be giving gifts at Christmas. My wife didn't mention it um, in her announcement, but on the same day as doing that children's production, we're also going to be doing a toy drive. Where we're going to be giving gifts of toys to deprived families in our community. We've been reaching into Ortsall, we've been reaching into Langworthy, and there may be some other areas as well. And we want to invite people, invite families to come out on the 16th from those areas right here to watch the production. But also we want to bless them. We want to bless them with a toy. And, you know, we've already received a donation from an organization, no strings attached, praise God, a donation of toys that we can give to deprived families. Ain't that beautiful? Ain't that amazing? So we already have a bunch of toys that we're going to be giving out to hurting people, people, families that maybe they really could do with one more toy. You know, they, they, they've got so much, but they could do with one more. But we also want to invite everyone in our church to be part of it too. So we want to invite everyone here to be part, to go and buy a toy. Go and buy a toy. Maybe it's a 10-pound toy, you know, from somewhere Asda or Toys R Us if they're still around. Or I don't know, Argos or someplace. I'm serious. Go and pray about it. Think about it. Um, and spend what you can on it. 
a, a toy to bless a hurting family, a family in need, and then bring it here. I think we have a collection area. Where is that collection area? In the back, a collect, there will be a collection area in the back, right over there, for you to come. Wrap it up nice, man. Wrap it up. Let wrap it up. Make it look good. Put it in the collection area, so on the 16th of December, we can bless a family in need with one extra present for their children this year. Can someone say amen? amen. See, that's, that's, that's what we want to do as a church. We want to be that kind of church, a church that fills the heartbeat of our community, of our city, and does what we can to meet the need. And sometimes giving gifts is part of that. How many know that the great gift giver himself is God? And there was a great gift that God gave to us. See, in as much as we're talking about giving a gift to a deprived family, we were all deprived in one way or another. Can someone say amen? I mean, every single one of us, no matter how much income, no matter what kind of car was in the drive, no matter how many rooms was in the house, every one of us was deprived because we couldn't do anything to save ourselves. We couldn't pay a price that could save ourselves from hell or from eternity without God. We couldn't pay a price that could wash all our sin and our guilt and our shame away. We could have labored every day of our lives for the rest of our lives and we'd never be able to pay a price great enough to secure our forgiveness, to wash away our guilt, to give us a fresh start and give us eternity with Jesus. But how many know that there was a God who loved us, a God who cared for us, that knew that we were deprived, that knew that we could not afford the price for sin. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come and to pay the price for us. He gave the gift of his own son and in the body and in the blood of his son, in the heart of his son was a precious, precious gift called grace. Say grace. Say it slowly. Yeah. Grace. There's that Christmas carol, isn't there? The third verse. Sun at night, holy night. Son of God, love's pure light. Radiant beams from thy holy face With the dawn of redeeming grace Jesus, Lord, at thy birth Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. The dawn of redeeming grace. Something began to emerge, to rise, to shine upon this dark world when Jesus came into it. It's not that there was no grace in the Old Testament. There was a lot of grace in the Old Testament. In fact, the very fact that God chose the people of Israel to give them his law, that in itself was an act of grace. He didn't have to choose them, but he did. So that was an act of grace. But when you read your Old Testament, anytime you see a phrase like, if I have found favor in your sight, that's grace. If any, you, ever you find a sentence in the Old Testament, he found or she found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That's grace. Noah found grace. Moses found grace. Gideon found grace. Samuel found grace. Esther found grace before the king. And that was a type of the grace that we can find before God. But when Jesus came, when Jesus came, it was a different, the most powerful revelation of grace that we had ever seen. It was a brand new era in the revelation of grace. 
in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says this, And the word, as Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of this only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, Jesus who came, Jesus who was born, born, Jesus who grew up, Jesus who reached adulthood, Jesus who walked among us, Jesus who healed the sick, Jesus who forgave sinners, Jesus who, 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 who battled against dark forces, Jesus who discipled and poured his life out into other men and women, Jesus who in Gethsemane decided not to be selfish but to pay the greatest ultimate sacrifice for the good and the health and the salvation of man. Jesus, who wasn't just words, but went through with it. Jesus, who took that cross and went up to the hill on that day of Calvary. Jesus, who allowed those men who didn't know what they were really doing to nail him through his hands and through his feet and hang him on a cross to die a slow death. Jesus was full of grace. The greatest, most powerful demonstration of grace the world had ever seen. Grace literally saved our souls. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. The grace that God gave us through Jesus Christ was the greatest gift that the world had ever received. You read that a man could have prayed all night. A woman could have worked all night. They could have labored. They could have sweated. They could have toiled. They could have done as many good deeds as they could possibly think of. They could have given away all the possessions, all their money, but no good deed, no act, no fasting would be able in itself to pay the price for sin. It had to be the gift of God who one day decided, I love these people so much that even though they cannot get themselves out of the sickness, even though they cannot get themselves out of the mud and out of the mire, even though they cannot get themselves out of the stench of sin, I am going to make a way. I am going to give them a gift. I am going to send my son and my son will be full of the grace that can get them out of it. The grace that can change them. The grace that can save their souls. And one day, some of us here in this room heard about the grace of God. And on that day, we got our faith and said, God, if you're out there, God, if you can really change me, God, if you can really turn me around, God, if you can really forgive me, because i got a list of things I've done, and i got a list of people I hurt and I got a, lost, a list of mistakes I made but God if you were able to wipe my slate clean God if you were able to give me a fresh start and an eternity with you here's my faith Lord save me and grace saved you that very day how many been saved today grace through faith. But what is this grace? What is this gift? What is grace? If you look it up in a dictionary, you'll find various definitions. And they're all true and they're all good. Very few go far enough. There's one that I do like, which is smoothness and elegance of movement like a ballet dancer or a thick don't call me twinkle mate <laughs> we'll have words after it's bad enough having a spur support rover here without you starting as well oh I like it I forgive you. 
<laughs> I was going to say like a figure skater, but I'm going to move on. <laughs> Smoothness and elegance of movement. Because I don't know about you, but when you see someone who's truly trusting in the grace of God, there's a smoothness about that person. You see, when you see someone who's all stressed out, frustrated, pulling their hair out, slobbering. I've been around since 1994. I've seen a few Christians slobber in my time. When you see someone who's not trusting in the grace of God, they're so like frantic and all over the place. But when you see someone who's trusting in God's grace, there's a smoothness to them. And I'm not talking about that fake it till you make it stuff either. I'm not talking about fake it till you make it. When did Jesus ever tell us to fake it? No, I'm talking about when you trust in the grace of God. There is a smoothness to you. See, think about Jesus. When I think about Jesus on the boat, the storm is raging around the boat. The disciples are all a mess. They're all like, oh, we're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. They're right in their will. They're praying. They don't want to gonna stop. And they go to Jesus and say, Jesus, you don't care about us. Like, we're going to die, Jesus. Do you think Jesus was like, oh, oh no, we're going to die. Wiping the sleep out of his eyes, stumbling his way to the... The, 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 the top of the boat and the, uh, w- waves, please stop. I don't think so. No matter how much that boat was moving, I imagine Jesus kind of like, like, like kind of just rising up. Do you know what I mean? Look at his disciples, <laughs> fellas. <laughs> Going to the top of the boat. And all like, And he's just like, you know, smooth and elegant. Be still already. Not pride, not arrogance. Grace. Grace. One theologian said that grace is favor. Grace is free, sovereign favor to the ill-deserving. One theologian says that grace is love. Grace is love that cares and stoops and rescues. One theologian said that grace is reaching. Grace is God reaching downward to people who are in rebellion against him. One theologian called Anthony Farrell, because we're all theologians, says... God, I mean, not not God, grace. Grace is God seeing you, choosing you, picking you out, and deciding to bless you because he loves you and he wants to. That's grace. Grace is the eyes of God scanning over the crowd and seeing you and saying, I just want to bless you. I just want to bless you. I had the privilege in the last service of giving someone who's not here now a Pentecostal handshake. Remember the old school Pentecostal handshakes? You know when you stretch out your hand to shake someone's hand and there's something in it? Come on, oh, come on now. Oh, Hallelujah. I just, I saw someone and I just felt like the Lord said to do it, so I did it. And they, I don't think they'd ever had it before. Because they came up to me and said, what's this for? <laughs> so I had to explain the whole thing to the guy. He didn't know what it was. Okay, well, explain, 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 explain. And he was like, oh, wow, like, you know, I was just thinking about how I'm going to get anything for lunch because I had no money for lunch. And he was like, thank you, thank you. I'm like, thank God. Because God saw you, chose you, picked you out, and just decided to bless you because he loves you and he wants to. That's grace. That's grace. 
Grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. It's not about, oh, I deserve this. I deserve, it's my time. No, it's not about that. It's not about, it's, it's God giving you what you don't even deserve. And how many know that mercy is God not giving you what you do deserve? Kind of get a witness. <laughs> I know mercy. I know God's mercy. But grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. Grace is God showing how good he is to people who haven't been that good to him. And there is such a power in grace. There's such a power. In fact, I kind of see grace as power. There's a power to this grace, this goodness, this generosity, this, 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 this gift of God, this, this grace. There's so much power in it. It's like it's power itself. It has the, it has the power to do things to you. Grace has the power to, to do things to you. And grace has the power to help you do the impossible. That's how powerful grace is. So what do I mean when I say grace has the power to do things to you? Well, well what does grace do for us? Well, let's check it out from the scriptures. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, this is what it says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and training us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Two things the scripture says about the grace of God. Number one, it saves us. And number two, it trains us. That's what this gift does. Number one, grace saves us. There's an old Andre Crouch song. Can I sing another song? I don't know why Jesus loved me. And I don't know why he cared. And I don't know why he sacrificed his life. Oh, but I'm glad. I'm glad he did. Come on, sing it if you know. I don't know why. Say, I don't know. Jesus loved me. Jesus loved me. Say, I don't know why. I don't know. He cared. He cared. Say, I don't know why. I, he sacrificed his life. He sacrificed. Oh, but I'm glad. Oh, but I'm glad. I'm glad he did. How many glad Jesus saved you? See, I don't know why. I don't know why Jesus loved me. I mean, on the one hand, I don't know why there are some things that happened in my life. I don't know why there are some things I had to go through. I don't know why there were some things that, were, that, that took place. I don't know why there were some, mis some mistakes I made. I, I don't know why I did some of the things I did. And I don't know why some of the things that were done to me were done to me. But all I do know is this. Jesus, for some reason I don't know why, came into my mess and saved me, and washed me, and cleansed me, and I'm not the same as I used to be anymore. I'm not the same man I used to be. I don't go where I used to go. I don't do what I used to do. I don't even say what I used to say. I'm a brand new man with a brand new mind. I feel like my body's brand new. I got a brand new life. I got a brand new future. I got a fresh anointing on my life. I am in better place right now than I've ever been in my entire life, and I don't know why Jesus loves me enough to bless me like that but I'm so glad he did I was so tired and sick of my dodginess but one day this thing that happened all those years ago in the Middle East on a cross smacked me between the eyes 
one day. It's like I saw the face of Jesus looking at me, saying, Anthony, I just love you. I just love you. I just love you. But I'm a mess. I'm a state. I smell. I'm weak. I'm frail. But I just love you. I just love you. There's someone in this room who keeps listening to the record of things playing in your mind, telling you you can't rise and you're not worth anything and you're never going to change. But I believe that 2,000 years ago, grace came and stretched out its arms on the cross for you. Why? Because God just loves you. Whether you're tall, whether you're short, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're fat, whether you're thin, Jesus just loves you. He just loves you. He just loves you. He knows you're not perfect. He knows you've got a long way to go. He knows you've still got struggles. He knows you just said a bad word. He knows what you did last summer. He knows what you've been thinking about. He knows who you said it to. He knows. But he just loves you enough to draw you close and get to work on all that junk. Can someone say amen? I'm so glad. I'm so glad he did. But not only does grace save us from ourselves as well as from an eternity, an eternity without God. I, 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 can you even imagine an eternity an eternity without God. You know, I got a little cat at home. It's not my cat, it's the kid's cat. That's Josephine's cat. Don't tell it's my cat, it's not my cat. And this cat, it's, it's clever enough, but when the door is closed, the cat will go to the door and will scratch and scratch, and scratch, and scratch. And the cat will stay there, scratching, scratching, trying to get through the door. I like the paint on the door, so I open the door. But imagine, imagine if the door of eternity closed and nothing no matter how hard you scratch, no matter how much you knock, imagine nothing, nothing being able to get you through that door. If it wasn't for the grace of God, we would stand forever at a locked door. We'd never know the peace. We'd never know the joy. We'd know only the fire of our conscience burning forever knowing that we could have got through if we just made the decision to put our faith in the grace of God. I don't know why Jesus loved me, but I'm not hanging about. I just want to get on with it. Lord, here I am. I don't want to waste another minute. If you can change me, change me. Grace saves us. But not only does grace save us, grace also trains us. Grace trains us to renounce ungodliness and to live self-controlled, godly lives. You see, grace isn't just about picking us up when we fall. Some people think that's what it's about. That grace is about picking us up when we fall. When we fall, then there's the grace of God to pick us up. In fact, there's a thing which some people call greasy grace. Now, the grace of God is not greasy. There's no such thing as greasy grace. But what they're trying to say when they say that is that there are people who think, well, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm just so loved. I'm so loved by God. He loves me so much so I can do what I like. And I can mess up how I like. And I can sin how I like. And I can smoke that and sleep there. And I can do all that stuff. And it's fine because I'm loved. That's greasy, man. 
That's not the grace of God. Because the grace not only picks us up when we fall, it does. But what the grace of God is really about is stopping us from falling in the first place. Grace is the power of God to not fall. In Romans chapter 5 verse 2, it says, this grace in which we stand. This grace in which we stand. Jude 24 and 25 talks about him who is able to keep you from falling. See, grace is not so much about getting up when you fall. Grace is about standing and not falling. Grace has the power, the power that in the middle of temptation, when voices are luring you left, right, and center, there's a power, there's a power that enables you to shake that thing off and say, no, that's done. I'm standing. I'm new. I am moving forward. I'm growing. I'm changing. I'm becoming a better man. I'm becoming a better woman. The grace of God is on my life. And I don't ever need to go back to the things I used to indulge in. I don't ever need to go back to those places. I don't ever need to put that stuff in my body. I don't ever need to build those kinds of relationships. I don't ever need to go back to that thing. I don't ever need to go back there because now I have what I didn't have before. Before I was fighting in my own strength. Before I was fighting on my own ability. Before I was trusting in my own intellect and calculations. But ever since the grace of God came into my life there was a power in my life that enables me to say no to cigarettes and no to drugs and no to illicit sex and no to whatever else. No to that temper. No to those words. No to that sin. Because of Jesus, there's a power in me that somehow, even though I'm weak, even though I'm frail, even though I struggle, somehow there's a power that enables me to walk on by. Du, 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 du. Walk on by. Du, 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 du. That's why I say it's power to help you do the impossible. Because some of those things are so strong and they go so deep that if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would have no defense. But because of the grace in my life, I can stand and I can even smile at it and say, no, you had me once. You're not having me again. On your bike, mate. Grace is a power that trains us how to stand. Trains us how to stand. See, I, I, I know what December's like for some people. I, I know that Christmas like, brings back stuff and feelings and experiences. And so for some people, Christmas is awesome. For some people, Christmas is tough. And it's a struggle. And, you know, maybe, I don't know, you find it hard just to, to kind of keep yourself together. I want to let you know there's a grace. There's a grace. And it's enough for you. A grace to go through this month and even have the best Christmas ever. The best Christmas ever. There's a grace to stand and to know him in a more intimate way this month than ever before. There's a grace to even go amongst unsaved family members and not lose your call. <laughs> Nervous laughter. There's grace. But what should we do with grace? Because how many have ever had that gift at Christmas? When you look at it and you're like, oh, that's nice. Oh, that's really nice. What is it? A 
And then come next year or the year after, you're cleaning out your wardrobe. <laughs> and there, right in the back of the wardrobe. Oh, yeah, look. Still don't know what it is. What do you do with grace? If God has given you and me the gift of grace, what do you do with it? Well, have a look at this scripture. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What do we do with grace? We grow in it. We grow in it. We get better at using it. Trust me, whenever you find yourself running around like a headless chicken, struggling, frantic, sweating from every pore and orifice you can think of, think, wait a minute, am I just laboring on my own strength here? Or am I trusting in grace? Because there's a smoothness when you're trusting in grace. And you grow in that. You grow in it. You learn through different situations and circumstances. You learn how to trust God's grace and not trust your own wisdom. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's about grace. You grow in it. And you know what? That's why it's so important. Let me just put this in here. It's so important to know, and you'll discover it as time goes by, how much grace you have. How much grace you have? Yeah, how much grace you have. The truth is you probably have more grace than you realize. But you got to know how much grace you have. See, I know that there are certain things I just have no grace to do. There are certain things, if I try and do them, all that's going to be there is flesh. I don't have the grace to do that. Someone else may have the grace to do it. But I don't have the grace to do that. But praise God, I know what I do have the grace to do. That's why I tell the worship team, I don't need a holiday. I don't need a vacation. I don't need time off. I got the grace. I got the grace. You know what? You stick me on that keyboard the rest of my life. I got grace to be on that keyboard. Not because I'm brilliant, because I'm not brilliant. I just got grace. And, and God refreshes those who refresh others. So I don't have to have a day off or sit down or I need a service to sit down. I don't know about all that stuff. I know about grace. That's what I know about. And when you're not trusting grace, you burn out. When you're operating in your own strength, you burn out. And I say this with not a hint of pride. I just say it because it's the truth. After all these years, married, Three kids, working in ministry, working a job, or doing a degree, or whatever else I've done, doing an album, traveling around the world, I haven't burnt out. Why? Because of the grace of God on my life. Through all the seasons, God has taught me not to trust in myself and my abilities, but to trust in the grace of God. I want other people involved, not because I need a break. I want other people involved because of their own potential. I want them to know grace like I know it. That wasn't in my notes. But it was all right. And you grow in that. It develops as you trust. James chapter 4, and I'm coming ready to close soon. Not, 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 just, not just yet. James chapter 4, verse 6. It says this, he gives, God gives more grace. See that? More. More means a greater or additional amount or degree. More grace. See, whatever God calls you to do, there's enough grace for it. There's enough grace. Paul discovered this when he said, your grace is sufficient for me. Your grace is enough for me. God's not going to ask you to do anything without gracing you to do it. See, God isn't the one that just puts on a jacket that fits. God's the one that gets a jacket that's a bit too big for you so you can grow into it. And at first, you might think, I look like an idiot. 
What am I doing this for? I look like an idiot. Look at me, I look like an idiot. My son Kai, he got a brand new uh, football strip for his football team. The Steves are like down here. It's like, it's okay, son. You will grow into it. You grow into it. More grace, more grace. But how, how, how do you grow in God's grace? The key is in this very same verse, James chapter 4, verse 6. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The way you grow in grace is by humbling yourself. You humble yourself and say, God, if you want me to do this, if that's you, I will do it. But the truth is, I don't know how to do it. I feel like it's too big for me. I feel inadequate. I, 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 I'm questioning myself. I'm going through changes. But God, if you've given me this responsibility, if you've given me this task, then I have to believe you've given me the grace. So God, I humble myself before you and I say, Lord, please teach me how to do this. Teach me how to trust you. Teach me how to go through this. Lord, if you're saying that I can go through this without going to the bottle, I humble myself before you, God, because I don't know how to do that in my own strength. But here I am, God, teach me how to go through this next season without a drop of that stuff. God, I don't know how to be a father. But God, if you're saying that, that's what I need to do. Then Lord, you've got to teach me because I don't know how to be a dad. I never had a dad. I ain't got a clue. I still remember when Dylan suddenly was like this high instead of that high. And I'm walking down Walthamstow Central in East London. And I'm holding it. I'm looking at it. And I'm like, God, what am I going to do? I don't know how to be a dad. I never had a dad. No man ever took any interest in me whatsoever. And now I'm trying to raise a boy. I don't I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this, God. I'm not going to break him. I'm not going to hurt him. I'm not going to ruin him. I don't know how to be a dad, God. And as I humbled myself before him, I felt like God was saying to me, Anthony, just, just be to him what I am to you. Who protects you? Who provides for you? Just protect him provide for him who holds you who loves you just hold him just love him who forgives you just forgive him just be to him how I am to you and I felt the grace and the power of God to be a father in that moment if God has given you something to do he has also giving you enough grace to do it. But the only way you will move forward without that grace is if you are proud. If you are proud, if you exalt yourself against the wisdom of God, if you say, I can do it in my own strength, then you will feel the hand of opposition because God opposes the proud. And if there's one opposition I do not want in my life, it is the opposition of God. When the hand of God moves against you, even Egyptian armies drown in the sea. I don't want to live my life against the momentum of God. I don't want to live my life a kicking against the goads. I don't want to live my life facing the face palm of God. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. What will you do as I close? And you can come on up, Jason. What will you do with the gift of grace that God has given to you, church? The grace that saves you. Have you given your life to Christ yet? Have, have you surrendered to Jesus yet? My brother, my sister, there's only a certain amount of time. There's only a certain amount of time before the door of eternity closes. 
And no matter how hard you knock on that door after that moment, there will be no way of opening it. Your time is given and counted by the Lord. And God is speaking to you at this moment. He's speaking to you at this moment and he is saying to you, my grace is sufficient for you, but there's time. There's a time. Today is the day of salvation. If you haven't given your life to Christ, don't walk out of these doors without giving your life to Christ. Don't walk out of these doors without saying, Jesus, if you can change me, change me. If you can forgive me, forgive me. If you can cleanse me, cleanse me. Or you may even be in the homes and you're there and you're going through it, but you haven't given your life yet. There is a moment of time. Today is the day. If you haven't given, if you haven't surrendered to Christ yet, don't walk out these doors today without saying, here I am, God, please save me, change me. Do it today. I'm yours. And maybe, maybe, maybe you've been trapped, trapped in a sin that is holding you captive. There is a time, my friends. There is a time. There is a time. God wants you free from that. He wants you free. He wants you free. He wants you soaring on wings like eagles. He wants you rising. He wants to see you stronger than ever. He wants to see your potential unleashed. He wants to move through you, love through you, speak through you. The grace that saved you is also the grace that can train you to live without that thing. Oh, you may well go to heaven. You may well go through because you put your trust in his saving grace. But while you're here on earth, don't you want to maximize your life on this earth? Why allow your life on this earth to be continually held back by something that you won't surrender to God? I say to you today, I'm, we're going into December. And I remember the day, I remember the day when I stood, I walked outside a pub and I saw a man from the home sitting there outside the pub. And I was like, dude, what on earth are you doing here, man? He said, I've had enough, I've had enough. I can't do this, I'm done. And they found him the next day in the King's Cross toilets dead I believe he went to heaven but man there was more for his life than that if you're here today and you find yourself going around and around in circles because even though you're saved you haven't accessed the grace that you have to live without that thing today is the day for your freedom today is the day to put your faith in the grace of God that is able to keep you from falling the grace in which you can stand Maybe God is calling you to a ministry, a ministry you feel that you cannot do, a ministry you feel that is too much for you, a ministry that you feel, God, I don't know how I can do that. I've got too many hang-ups. I remember when I was doing the album, which is recorded now, but I had so many hang-ups just getting in that booth and listening to myself and putting these songs on an album. I went through so many changes. I wanted to stop, but God said to me, Anthony, you've got two choices. Either finish this in obedience to me, either be healed or disobey. Either be healed of that stuff that's inside you and do it or walk away from it and live in disobedience. And I said, God, I don't want that on my life. I'm staying right here in this booth. Ah. Sang my little heart out for what it's worth. Maybe God's calling you to a ministry, but because of hang-ups and issues and whatever else, you're not doing it. But the thing is, how much longer will you live like that? 
at some point trust the grace of God and step out in the power. Remember that grace is a free gift from God. It's just because He loves you that He empowers you to do what you never thought you could do. So today is the day. As the worship team comes back up to the platform and as we all stand, thank you for allowing me to go a little bit longer than I planned to. But I believe this is a beautiful day today. I can feel the grace of God in this room. I feel like the Lord has been speaking to people in this room. I believe there are some people here in this room that you are about to end 2018 stronger than ever. I believe there are people in this room who are going to have better mental health at the end of this year than you've ever had before. And it's not going to stop there. It's going to grow. It's going to continue. As you grow in grace, there is a healing that will even take place inside your mind. I believe there is grace here. I believe it is falling like the rain in this place. And if this is you today, if you want to respond right now, if you refuse to allow this moment to pass, if you're saying, God, here I am, I humble myself before you, give me the grace I need, then the altars are open, you come out here to the front, find your place right here, no one's looking at you, and even if they were, who cares, it's not about that, it's about just trusting, trusting in the grace of God, it's just about saying, God, here I am, here I am, God. I know I cannot move forward. I know I cannot progress without your grace on my life. So, Lord, here I am. If you're not a Christian, if you've never given your life to Christ, then just come forward and just begin to say, or even right there in your seat, just begin to say, God, I don't want to leave here. I don't want to leave here without knowing, Lord, that you're in my heart, that you're in my life. I don't want to lock you out, God. Come into my life. Change me. Forgive me. Cleanse me. I want a brand new start, God. I want a brand new start. I don't want to live eternally without you.